All right, class, this is a review for chapter seven, designing organizational structures. These are the learning outcomes for the chapters. There are eight learning outcomes. Please review them in the PowerPoint slide and review them in a textbook as you read through the chapter seven textbook. This is a very good organizational chart, um, an example for a typical appliance manufacturer. What this chart shows is the chain of command, the president's on top, the vice president, and under the vice presidents are the departments, finance, operations, and marketing. And then under each department of finance, operations, and marketing, there are different job categories. Another exhibit talks about functional departmentalization. When you have the president and underneath that president, you got legal, human resources, manufacturing, engineering, marketing and finance. And then under there, the pr product departmentalization, you have the CEO and the administrator. And under this, you have different heads of the department. These are pretty interesting uh, departmentalization and it really depends on the type of business that one is running. Take a look at this chart. And here's another chart that you could take a look at. And some more charts. Now, now these charts, line function chart and staff function charts, it, it, it differentiates by color codedness. Take a look at that detail within your textbook. Some concept checks. Let's play this video and take a look at it. Every organization has an org chart, but did you know there are lots of different types of org charts? Let's take a look at the seven and a half most common. A functional org chart has common departments that are organized by separating each area and managing them independent of others. A product and geographical org chart divide the company by a specific product line or geography and are operated as if they were separate companies. A hierarchical org chart has a distinct chain of vertical command with definite structure, ranks, and tends to have high levels of bureaucracy. A flat org chart displays a small number of levels and a broad span of management at each level. The goal is to give each employee equal footing. With holacracy, employees are organized around work, projects, and objectives, rather than departments. Decisions are made from anywhere by anyone. In a matrix org chart, teams are created by bringing people together from different areas of the business to work on a specific project. Employees will report to the project leader and their department manager. Tribes and squads is a subset of the matrix structure. Tribes are a collection of groups called squads that work in a related area with one common leader. Each squad has one focus and all the resources necessary to accomplish their goal. Okay, hopefully you found this YouTube video useful. So here are some questions to consider based on that video that we just saw. Here's a matrix organization chart. This is a little more complex from the president and the four functions of the project manager. Here's some concept checks for section two. Let's take a look at this video that explains what a matrix organization is. What is a matrix organization? A matrix organization has a complicated structure in which the reporting relationships are set up as a matrix, a grid, instead of the traditional vertical hierarchy. Employees in a matrix organization generally report to both a product or project manager as well as a functional manager, i.e. a department head. This structure facilitates the horizontal flow of information 
and skills. Look at the matrix structure of the fictitious company ACME Inc. The five employees in the image who form part of a special project team must report to two bosses. They have to report to the project manager and also their head of department. In matrix organizations, employees must report to more than one person. Matrix management structures are found mainly when there are big projects or product development processes. They draw on employees from a wide range of functional disciplines for assignment to a team. However, the employees still retain their respective positions. There are three main types of matrix organizations. One, weak functional matrix in which the project manager has only limited authority. Two, balanced functional matrix in which the project manager is assigned to oversee the project power is shared equally with functional managers and three strong project matrix in which the project manager is primarily responsible philip a dutch technology company headquartered in amsterdam set up the matrix management in the 1970s with its managers reporting to both a product division manager as well as a geographical manager. The grid system soon caught on, and several other large multinationals including Texas Instruments, Hughes Aircraft, General Motors and Caterpillar Tractor started setting up matrix structures. In other words, they set up reporting along both project and functional lines. Thank you for watching this Market Business News video on matrix organizations. Okay. These are some questions to consider on contemporary structures. This table shows about the strengths and weakness of group decision making. Um, read further details in your textbook and the chapter PowerPoints and your chapter outlines that I sent to you. One of the things I also like to address is highlighted right here in terms of the weakness. Sorry. It says groups typically take a longer time to reach a solution than individuals take. Well, there's so much diversity in group work from different perspectives and different perceptions on where they're coming from. So it takes a longer time when collaborating to come up with a decision. That's one of the reasons why sometimes people don't like group work. But you also have to think about how many members are in your group. Is it a large group of eight people? Yes, that might be difficult. But what if it was just a group members of three? It's a little more conversational and have a little more ease of making that decision, right? And I mentioned the strength right here. Groups offer a diversity of perspective and therefore generate a greater number of disagreements. That is considered a strength because you wanna make sure that the company or the project is going in the right direction. Here's some concept checks. Let's take a look at this video on Zappos. <laughs> I don't have a title. Um, I work on the Holacracy project. Research tells us that as a city doubles in size, the productivity of its citizens increased by 15%. Um, and unfortunately, the opposite tends to be true for companies. So Holacracy is our new organizational system to make Zappos run more like a city. Our CEO, Tony Shea, ratified the Holacracy Constitution about eight months ago for the company. Here's the legit one right there. <laughs> We're asking managers to distribute authority to their teams, right? And to get rid of their titles, which is an incredible ask, first of all. But we're also asking team members to step up and take ownership over their work in a way that maybe they haven't before. The idea is that when you distribute authority and you make sure that people take ownership over their work and you're not busy overseeing the work of other people, that it frees up capacity so that you can do all of those projects that you've had on your to-do list for months and months, but you just haven't had the bandwidth to do. I think people need to understand 
the system, the rules, like what, what we're moving into. As the director of the department, I struggled in the beginning with really finding my place within the system and understanding how is this going to work, where do I fit in, what is my job now in this process. I thought I was providing this environment already, that they had the freedom to do these things, but seeing in reality that that wasn't as clear as I thought it was to them. The growth and the leaps and bounds that they took as a team was amazing. Thanks for calling Zappos.com. This is Stephanie. How can I help you? What a lot of people have picked up on is the no managers headline, which is uh, true and false. The true part of it is there will be no more titles. So if you think about it, managers are really responsible for two separate things. One is being the technical advisor for their work, and the other is sort of the people management or people development. Um, and we all know of a manager that's been promoted because they're a great individual contributor, but may not necessarily be a great people person or people developer. Um, so in Holacracy, um, what we can do is we can split those two roles apart or decouple those two roles. Each one of these circles will have something called a lead link, and the lead link's major accountability is uh, resource distribution. Um, go ahead and put that in my Role right now. Setting priorities, uh, metrics for that circle, so that still exists. Um, it just kind of takes that people management piece out of there. The people people circle is uh, putting together a group of folks who are really passionate about professional development. These people people could not have been the former manager of that person, so you know you're getting somebody new to help you and professionally develop you. I think it's really interesting. I like the idea of it and um, it just sounds like it's going to be really cool. Once you get used to the system, you get to the point where you want everything to run through the system. And so when you interact with different areas that aren't in the system, things become then frustrating on the other side. We've had reorganizations that have taken place in 10 minutes in the middle of a meeting, where an entire team has moved from one side of the company to another because it better aligns with the purpose of that part of the team. Yeah, it's a big risk, yeah, but there's huge reward, you know, the opportunity to become a more innovative, more agile company, um, one that doesn't suffer from the problems of bureaucracy um, and politics and is more open to change is it's a risk that we're willing to take. It is radical, the idea that you should self-organize. There are a lot of things that we don't have the answer to. Um, we are working on big puzzles like compensation and progression. Um, again, we feel hopeful that we'll be able to figure it out, but, you know, we still have yet to see how the story unfolds. Okay, um, review this video again. It's embedded into your PowerPoint slide lecture that was uh, available to you. And these are some questions to consider. These are some uh, charts about the narrow and wide spans of control, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Read through them carefully. There's another concept check. And here's some concept checks for section five. Make sure you re read the textbook and look at the outlines. This is an important concept in any organization when it comes to centralization versus decentralization. Let's take a look at this video. In this video, we're going to talk about the difference between centralization and decentralization in organizations. So let's unpack the details. Hello again, friends, Alex Lyon here. If you've never tuned into this channel before, Communication Coach, we put out weekly videos on professional communication and leadership skills. And today we're going to talk about centralization versus decentralization in organizational settings. I think once you see each of these in their side-by-side -side comparisons, you'll be able to see your own personal experience a little bit more clearly and understand how organizations work. And as we talk about each of these, I would like to invite you to make a comment below in that section below the video about where you see the strengths and the disadvantages under each of these models. So let's start with the centralized style of organizational structure. This is where you see all of the power concentrated in a single individual or a small group of individuals. In fact, the telltale sign you're dealing with a centralized type of organization is where the top boss is the president, CEO, and chairman of the board. That's highly centralized 
authority under one person. And as a result, all of the power, authority, and the decision-making power is held in that person's hands. So a lot of times what you'll see is quite a bit of top-down communication where the person in the top position makes a decision and hands that communication down, hands that decision down, and the communication flows down the chain of command all the way eventually down to the people at the front line of the organization. So in that way you have what we call the classic hierarchy. You have all of the levels represented like in a military style where you have the top general, so to speak, the top officers, and then all the middle people, and then finally the frontline supervisors and frontline employees. So it's a pyramid, if you will. And as part of every pyramid, you also frequently see division of labor, where each of these jobs is broken up into small little pieces. So you might do one little thing and then hand it off to the next person. It's a little bit like an assembly line where everybody just does one little tiny piece of the job to complete the job overall in the end. Now, even if you're in an office setting, by the way, you can still feel this assembly line philosophy woven into this hierarchy and this division of labor style that you often see in a centralized style of organizations. So what we end up with is something that is tightly coupled, a system that has tight coupling. So everything in the organization is directly connected. And if one thing happens in this department, the other departments feel the jolt. So anytime something happens in an assembly line, let's say you're going from A to Z to finish your product, if something happens at step C, the whole assembly line has to stop and that becomes a really big problem for the organization because all the work grinds to a complete halt. So it's tightly coupled. Now the upside of a centralized style of organization is control and stability. In fact, the whole thing is designed for control. So if you consider that an advantage, then it is. The downside is that they're not very flexible. So if change happens, they're pretty bad at adapting to that change, especially in the marketplace. And also they're really bad at upward communication, that bottom up communication. So if there's good feedback from employees or from customers, it doesn't really make it to the top level decision makers through all those levels of hierarchy. And if they do hear about something, it's usually distorted or tainted a little bit. So that's the centralized style. Now let's contrast that with the decentralized style of organizations. And this is where the control is spread out. So you don't have one person that's the chairman, the CEO, and the president. You have people in different positions like this so that decision-making power is somewhat spread out. Authority is somewhat spread out, just like in the states of the United States, we have 50 states, we have a central government. Let's just pretend for a minute that our country was more emphasized on the state level control. That would be a little bit more decentralized. And it's the same way in an organization. When power is distributed between and among the teams or the units or the department heads, that's a little bit more decentralized. So it doesn't all have to go through the people at the very, very top of the hierarchy. And so as a result, you often have decision-making power as well as communication spread out throughout the groups and the team. So lots more communication between and among team members on a team and between and among the teams themselves. So not a hierarchy and division of labor, but there's team-based work. So you have a lot of cross-training. People know how to do multiple jobs and know how to learn over time through cross-training how to work with others outside of their immediate department. You end up with something called a loosely coupled system. So instead of an assembly line where it's tightly coupled and everything is directly affecting the other, a loosely coupled system is where the pieces are still connected, but the connection is more of an interdependent connection. So if one team has a problem, it's not likely to directly affect the other teams. They might feel some influence eventually, but the other teams can keep working. The assembly line doesn't grind to a halt because it's not organized that way. So the advantages of a decentralized organization, obviously it's flexible and adaptable to changes in the marketplace. And usually teams produce very high quality products and services. The downside is that coordination is not automatic and teams have to learn over time to get better at communicating between and among the teams so that they're not just working in a completely isolated fashion. They have to work all together as well at times. So those are contrasting 
look and a comparison at centralized versus decentralized organizations. As I put these side by side here, I would like to ask you, which one do you most relate to? Where do you see yourself in each of these in your professional experience? Again, as I mentioned, I would love to hear you comment in that section below the video. I look forward to reading those comments. And if you have never subscribed to this channel, I invite you to do so. As I mentioned, we put out weekly content on professional communication and leadership skills. So until next time, God bless, and I will see you in the next video. All right. Let's move on. Here are some questions to consider when it comes to centralization versus decentralization. This is a table that talks about the mechanistic versus organic structures within an organization, right? Take a look at this chart and think about what your organization will be. Will you be a mechanistic structure or organic structure? This is another table. Some concept checks for section six, concept checks for section seven, and concept checks for section eight. Remember to read all the chapters in the textbook. It's a free open stacks. Uh, open exchange resource textbook, and also check out the outlines and PowerPoints that were sent to you. And let me know if you have any questions and contact me via email or Canvas. Thank you.